is incomplete, nobody knows what fertilizer is, if poor information on pests, the national ag research systems basically don't work really well, they try hard I think, but it's not terribly effective yet. So you have an information paucity. And once again, I'm gonna go back to this idea, if you don't have location specificity, in this case of your information, you can't get it right, all right? So, big challenges, next slide. Part of what location also drives is a very sensitivity to temporal problems. Just like I said, the winter here gives everybody a starting point. Everybody likes to think about, you know, the rainy seasons and the dry seasons kind of give you a pulse, but one of the comments on that one slide was climate change. One of the most interesting facets of what's happening in our climate today is that variability is increasing. I'm an agricultural climatologist, and the, some of the fascinating stuff that, you know, you run into anecdotal, but, um, now I'm going to forget his name, so I won't bother, but he, Tim Flannery wrote a book called The Future Years, which is interesting. Then he wrote one about North America, the name escapes me. Um, first third of which will really, really help you sleep, but then it gets interesting. And what he basically says is, is because we have a north-south mountain range, stretching, as you know, from really pole to pole, but the amplitude of the variance of any climate mean change will be 4 to 5x in North America. Just, just keep that one in mind for a while. Just as you read things in the next six months, that means if global change warms up two degrees, somehow we're going to do somewhere between minus four and plus four times that variance. And that why? Well, because the Earth turns one direction and winds come from the west, and when they hit mountains, it just changes the way the weather pattern flows. And that's why we have these wild swings in the weather. So we have spatial and temporal issues around location. And you have to have both, you have to be able to handle both. And that's really the magic, the innovation of, we're a startup company, of 25 employees now. Uh, we're hiring more, so to speak. I mean, literally, we're looking for people, uh, very specific talents, um, some programmers, uh, things like that, like in our North Carolina office. But we have a very innovative architecture to manage location and time. And therein lies, if you will, the rest of the story that we'll talk about, some of the problems. Next slide. So, when we talk about it, one of the things that's really easy today, all of you have smartphones, and it has a GPS, and you can put a survey on a smartphone, which right away will make your data entry a whole lot easier. But as you collect that, and you hit a button and it goes through the cell system or a Wi-Fi to do a database somewhere, we have a system, and that systems exist, to look at that data anywhere on Earth, right, online. So now you have the ability to real-time monitor. Now what that means is, is that you can do course corrections if your survey Maybe you have different enumerators. Maybe one of the questions is slightly misunderstood. Maybe it was in the translation, and you're supposed to be scoring things toward nine or 10. Instead, they're scoring ones or twos. You can see it right away. You can pick up the phone and actually call the enumerator while they're in the field if things get corrected. So you get better data. Obviously, better data is really important. <laughs> Flat out from the beginning. So once you start to do all that kind of thing, now you can start to target things. And by the way, we talk of ourselves as being a innovative data management company, because people kind of knows what that means, but actually we're a targeting company. That's what we are. We will help you take very disparate data, census, household interviews, soils, climates, weather, crop models, and tell you where an action will work. Okay, because where and when is the key to having an intervention in doctor. So we're a targeting company. What we mean by evidence-based decisions, this comes right out of the words that global development is now hearing more and more, and frankly, I'm going to say it comes from Bill, uh, Bill Gates. He was a businessman, and one of the weird things about USAID and traditional, like when I started in the CGI, our system, some of you may know that, that's the, the global um, consultant group of international ag research. There really wasn't much accountability. You know, if you did a farmer training day, you said, I trained 200 farmers, that's an action, and that's pretty good. Well, Bill Gates has carried that story to say, that's an action, I want an outcome. How many adopted what you taught them? Meaning you have to go back and do a survey. We're not talking about a baseline three hour interview. We're talking about five questions, 10 questions, light touch, three minutes, move on. It's a new world. It's really a good time to be starting with global development. Plus Africa is a tremendous opportunity. Next slide. So what we talk about in our company and what we try to say is really important is a whole solution. You have to have a way to acquire data, okay? And that's your smartphone. But understand that acquiring data now, if you do it right by location and time, third-party data like census, like weather data, things like that should just be readily available for your location. So you don't have to learn how to be a meteorologist to understand the meteorological impact of a 
malaria when you're at home for it. You should be able to just find that. So we're good at this acquire stuff, discovery. You need to be able to look at lots of information, right? And I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. It has to do with statistics, frankly, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But discovering things, you need to be able to see it, and you need to be able to choose variables that give you more than just sort of factor analysis uh, correlation. You're looking for causality. Because, of course, once you get causality, then you can predict. But once you predict, you win. <laughs> Period. <laughs> okay? Because if I know, to put it very simply, I know that that variety will grow this season on that piece of ground. Everybody wins. The fertilizer guy will know he'll have a market. The processor knows there's something to take off the land. And the farmer will get a better price because there's more of it. It's more efficient. Right? Information is really important across that value chain. So then you go down to analysis, and all of you are very much deep into analysis. You have to be able to statistically and otherwise quantifiably support what's going on. And finally, sharing it. This is this idea of public, uh, all Gates contracts, for example, say that they have to be publicly accessible when you're done. And this is important because that's the only way to leverage knowledge. And knowledge is uh, one of those really cool things because if you share some knowledge with me, you don't have less of it. Like the bottom water. And that's really important. So knowledge is sticky, leaky, and tricky, and I'll leave that to you to figure out. That's from a lecture you'll find. Not mine, that's from a thing you might find it on. Next slide. So why vocation? And I'm going to tell you, and I think I was in a class, it was PDs, Peter? I uh, mentioned if you're going to collect data, you collect it with location. Just do it. You will really regret it if you don't. Next slide. So, when it comes to big data, and I'll mention sort of tweeting and other things that are traditional big data, but understand that if you collect location, you can derive all kinds of data from it. You don't have to know and ask the farmer, how far are you from the market? You don't have to. You can ask them if you want to, but you can calculate it. Because if you have the road network and where the markets are, and you have the GPS of the farm, it's that far. So you can derive all kinds of information. You can tell. You don't have to ask them how much it rains. I mean, give me a break. How much does it rain where you, you know, where you live? I mean, these are silly questions, really, because you can go get that data, all right? Then what happens is that contextual data is actually a source of causality. It's a source of those correlations. It's a source of information. I mean, everything from the fact that you're in this position on the landscape, particularly um, when you think of aspect in the northern, um, northern latitudes, southern latitudes, but in the tropics, aspect's not so important, mm -hmm. but clearly where you are in the watershed is. If you're downstream from something, it's useful to know what it is. So location gets to be really important. And it's not so important because you're going to learn GIS, and I wouldn't even recommend it. That's not important. There are people who are good at that stuff. I've learned to hire them. I used to be good at it. long <laughs> since forgotten. Okay? The point is, you need to have a sense of why. The sense of why is you can derive <coughs> and find all kinds of other literally statistically valid characteristics of your observations. Next slide. Can we just like bottle that up? Would you just uh, 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 don't worry, GIS. Knowledge is supposed to, <laughs> I don't have less of it, go right ahead. I'm not sure what you mean by bottling it though because things I bottle typically are fermented. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, all of you have seen these sorts of Twitter artists. This is traditional big data. There's all kinds of engines to process it. Stuart, uh, the guy that my co-founder just got back from a Strata conference, some of you may be familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And everybody is building fantastic engines to use Hadoop and calculate billions and billions of records. And I'm pointing out they're not even touching the kinds of sizes of stuff that we do with. Okay? Because I can talk about, you know, soil and weather and household interviews and already right, you get everybody get that okay. And I could derive lots of data, but as soon as I mentioned satellites, sorry, you just taken you just turned it into petabytes. Okay. And, and it's not much fun to deal with that much data because, frankly, I'm not interested in the bits. I'm interested in deriving the information out of it. That becomes valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's a, I, I'm not a satellite person at this. I'm not going to go there on this topic. Next slide. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here to talk about what big data really means in this context of location. Next slide. So let's start with weather. I'm an climate guy, so I get to start with there. Also, uh, Lizzie will be um, handing out something. There is. Um, Daily weather available for all of South Asia and parts of most of Eastern and Southern Africa, West Africa, through a gate grant, it's freely available. You can log in and use it. Oh, yeah. uh, weather data, though, is big in our world. The reason is, is we interpolate a grid. So about every eight kilometers, you have a weather station. That's the best way to look. It's a synthetic weather station, 
but the point is, is things will vary over space. One of the best examples is we were looking at some rainfall data in Uganda, and uh, there's a tendency a little bit towards some of the districts have a very north-south um, feature, I guess, uh, uh, near the lake. And of course, near the lake, there's much higher rainfall in the northern area there isn't. So taking an average district rainfall means absolutely nothing. And I had a conversation this morning with ICF. Does anyone know what that is? I think it's a big contractor. Big contractor. They are the implementation art of the DHS survey. And they've been trying to find a correlation between average district rainfall and prevalence of malaria. And I'm like, well, that's a statistical improbability. Because <laughs> if you don't have location, you're averaging something that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. I'm a climate guy. I worked in Kitui in eastern Kenya. It's by the rainy season. On average, it rains about 500 millimeters a year out there, and it never actually happens. You either get 800 when the rains come, or you get 200 when they don't. Literally, a distribution. So it's a, not a normal distribution. Just keep that in mind for a little later. Weather data. So we have these terabyte-sized weather data sets. You can click on a location and get a stack of all the weather data for the last 10 years, daily data, that kind of thing. Weather data is big. Now, what can you do with that? Next. This is how we create it. It's a grid. Okay? Just keep thinking about that. The value of the grid, as opposed to the observation stations, is you can get an area back to targeting. If I have the area, I can prioritize what's important, and then I can target my intervention. So, you all know what the word drought means. Okay? I bet you don't, but I'm going to pretend that for a minute. You, you know it's dry. My point is, a drought has very differing impact, right, depending on the adaption of the population. So all of a sudden, I just said, you need to integrate where the drought is, where are you drier than normal grid cells, where are the people, land scan or other census data, and where are the people vulnerable to drought who aren't used to it, mm -hmm. right? So now you have to look at the historical semi-arid area that are used to it, they're going to be more adapted to it, someplace that's typically wet, they probably have no idea what to do. You see my point. So targeting is not a simple thing, but it is a spatial thing if you want to make a difference. Okay? Now my colleagues from Britain, I always laugh at. You know, if it doesn't rain in the summertime in the UK, they have water restrictions after about two weeks because they don't store it. And here in Colorado, we'll go three years before they put other than voluntary, right? Why? We're adapted to it. We're in a semi-arid area. That's adaption. That's all it is. Okay? There's lots of things you can do. Next slide. Um, these are the sorts of things you're going to be able to do online, right? You click a location, you get a chart like that. All right, so that's just the tool. Lizzie will have a handout. Next slide. So here's some things you can do spatially. So you can look at growing seasons, and you can look at pest models. And the point is, we're orient orienting the weather data not by chronology. It's useful. It's dangerous but by what the plant means. So if you've got a variety of maize that means 120 days and 400 millimeters, when do you start counting the season is very important. You might as well get it right. You've got a spatially varying surface of weather, means you can actually start it on October 15th here, and October 28th here, and November 5th here, so that it's the plant that's getting the characteristic of the growing season, not October 15th, which is a rather arbitrary date. But it gets complicated. It's spatially big computations, all right? But that's the value of space, of location in space. Next slide. So one of the more interesting analyses that can come out of these sorts of things are what they call climate homologues sometimes. So some work we did with some of the big crop, commercial crop companies in the US, they've got a variety across our Great Plains. This is where the right number of growing degree days. Temperature is what determines where things grow first. Water is second, if you can irrigate. So that it will grow in that area. And all we had to do was pick up the characteristics of that area and say, we're in China, will this grow? Bang, we just saved them two years of field trials. Targeting is worth a lot of dollars. It'll save you a lot of time. Next slide. So, some new data coming. Um, we have an agreement with Colorado State University. Uh, a theoretical atmospheric scientist there is becoming a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Andy Jones. He, he works with a NASA constellation of nine polar orbiting satellites which produce information that his algorithms convert to hourly rainfall for the entire planet <laughs> on a grid that's 16 kilometers. We're converting it to our grid, which is close <coughs> to eight kilometers. We're going to have that rainfall data in our system because rainfall is the weakest um, bit of information.
observation you find in our data sets, because it's dependent on the ground observations, which aren't very dense. But this will give us a spatial. Now think about food security implications. You've got grid cells, you know how many people, you know the soils, you know the temperature, and now you have some idea of the, of the rainfall. You can start to calculate how many calories can come off the ground and whether those people want to look where they're food should. Next slide. Mobile surveys. I mentioned this already. Uh, if you want to be accountable, you want to be able to find out who adopted your intervention. And now it's not a thing that happens three years after the project is over, we're attempting to attribute your good advice that you gave, you do it in real time. So surveys today are not once a year, once every third year, they're continuous. Think about that as a, mon a truly monitoring, plus you have a lot more opportunities to interact with the very people who are, in a sense, teaching you what they need. And that's really important, to listen hard. So you get a lot of data through this. Next slide. And I had to do this just because if you really want petabytes, I'll throw some big slides up here. So, Worldview 2, next one. <laughs> you all have seen the uh, Opera House in Sydney, right? You can get really interesting pictures from that satellite. Pictures don't tell the whole story. Okay? Right? They're pixels. They're multi-spectral pixels from which you can derive all kinds of information. Next one. From that information, you've got all these different resolutions. Lots and lots and lots of data. Next one. Your band, some of you have probably done some remote sensing work. It gets complicated. Why? Well, because the spectral signature changes depending on atmospheric turbidity, sun angle, all kinds of things. And frankly, it's a lot of work. And it'll chew you up if you're not careful. So I'm just saying, there's a lot of data that can be very useful if you target what you do with it. Next slide. So one of the projects we tried last year, it is from a research perspective, absolutely capable of doing this. Mind you, we were looking at swing pools in Southern California, so this is definitely marketing. Point is, a satellite can tell you whether the water is the right organic mix in the water to breed mosquitoes. So guess what? If you can find mosquitoes when they're still in that stage, they are CIA. This is right out of Bob Novak's papers. Concentrated, immobile, and excessive. Okay? You can kill them. You can put a larva site in there. You can put fish in there. You can do something. But once they come out, it's really hard to control mosquitoes. That's even in urban environments. Next slide. So we know that mosquitoes in particular are a big deal in Africa. And this research is driving toward the capability of using satellite remote sensing to identify probable locations for where a larva site treatment would do or be more effective. That's a uh, not a commercial leader. Possible thing to do. It's just the satellite image is too expensive. It doesn't come fast enough. It's way too much data. It's not. It's just not there yet. But these are the kinds of very interesting leading edge things that are being done out there. Thanks. So we know this. You have this gargantuan package of siloed data. What stitches it together? Come on, you should chant Location. It. Location. <laughs> Thank you. Someone over there wanted. It's happening right now, guys. This is this is very this has been my life. I don't know why, but when I was a little boy, my dad's a geophysicist. I had maps all over the house. My head does a really interesting. I can look at this stuff and it makes sense to me from when I was little. This has made sense to me from the beginning. What I mean is, is that all of that data is context, and that context is the causality. Somewhere in there is the clue of what you need to monitor. Think of think of. Uh, Index. What's the other word we use? Come on. Um, no, you know what are the? Everybody wants Gates wants a list of indicators. <laughs> um, everybody wants indicators. They want something that's relatively easy to collect either the attributes of and calculate the integrate indicator. <laughs> and uh, my kids are accusing me of this lately too. It's really interesting. My head. Um, the indicator, but the point is, if you get the indicator right, it indicates it's exactly what you're looking for. It's 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 the Dow Jones. It tells you something about what's going on that is actionable. Now, there's lots of indicators out there that are hard to get at. Some are easy to get at, and not very interpretable. My point is, if you start using location, you start connecting it to all this other stuff. The probability of getting really actionable things that are useful in that location, that area, for that moment in time will work, and those indicators should change seasonally, right? And they should change and be different for different geographies, absolutely. Different populations, different problems, different soils, different culture, ethnic groups, different everything. My point is, indicators are a good idea 
But if you're not looking at how they vary over space and time, mm -hmm. you're going to get frustrated because it won't statistically work everywhere. Next slide. So, two big categories of challenges in the big data world. We'll touch the first one first. There's three slides. I don't know that much about this, but I'm going to tell you what the big challenges are, and then we'll touch a little bit on the statistical problem of geography. Next one. So we've got some technical challenges in big data. I mean, how do you handle real time with, 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 with Ushahidi and tweeting and things that are fast and weather and derivative data and satellite imagery? How do you handle things like statistical science that isn't ready for location? And I'm going to touch on that a little bit more deeply. And how do you leverage that to actually push it back to the very people who are collecting it? That's actually a brilliant model, always. If someone's sending you something, I mean, what if you send it something back to them? That's a good trade information, right? Mm -hmm. So next slide. We know that the problem with Hadoop, some of you know what Hadoop is, right? This is this massive nodes of calculation. The problem is, as soon as you put geography in, location <coughs> is one, if it's in a different node, will never find proximity. It's spatial nearest neighbor in form. Now there's technical ways of going around this. You multi-pass, you do a lot of things, but you're talking about massive calculations. So this is something Stuart presented, he's saying, hey, we need to, in the big data world, we need to start accounting for location, right? Next slide. And so in general, you've got this ability to go do a batch analysis, but not do it in real time. You need geospatial data in there because that's going to be the intervention. I mean, that's where it's going to come from. And then the next set of being able to move massive amounts of data is a technical thing that is going to happen. In other words, it's an opportunity. It's going to be there. Even processing satellite remote sensing, it's going to happen. It's not going to be as expensive in two years as it was today. Next slide. OK, so now things get really interesting. So all of you have collected data. You've bothered to get your GPS. And now I'm going to tell you, guess what? All data and geography are autocorrelated. What does that do to your stats? Violates one of the damn assumptions. And you better keep that in mind. All right, seriously. A lot of parametric statistics, what do they do? They assume no autocorrelation. They assume normal distribution in the, in the, in the, in the population. And uh, they assume independence. And yet, I'll invert that question and point out that if you collect the GPS point in a sample of 1,000 households, what you're looking for is the spatial cluster. You're actually looking for that. As opposed to saying, oh, I can't use it because they're obviously out of correlated, right? I mean, people live by similar types of economics and people, we all know that. The point is, yeah, they're out of correlated, so go find it. That's your target. That's how you're going to get more adoption. If your solution works for families with small children of a certain income type, certain landholding type, in a, you know, maize, rice, wheat, doesn't matter which ecosystem, uh, if you find it, they'll adopt it better. But you have to be willing to visualize your data. You've got to look at it. And that's the point. That clustering is actually the signal you're looking for. And by the way, there's a lot of noise in big data. Lots of noise. So when you start mapping and using analytical results, look at your data. Next slide. So looking at your data. So I took all those grid cells and I said, OK, let's calculate a really massive words cluster analysis, which I get to date myself. When I lived in Nairobi, we had 1,500. Computers. It took five days for SAS to run a wars on the various cluster analysis. 76,000 cells in about 62 hours. My laptop will now do that in less than two minutes. So, you see this yellow block over here? The one uh, kind of just above where my head is? Notice there's a black line right through the middle. That's a political administrative boundary. So, in geography, if you're going to start using geography, which I am saying, if your experimental unit is bounded by a political boundary and an arbitrary administrative line, you will find, for example, that the coastal province viewed that little bit of yellow agroecological type as not very important to them. And central or eastern province, which is where Petui is, did the same thing. And they missed a huge opportunity to work together because they don't, right? Different political, they don't. The point is, Agroecological, the bioecological may actually be more important to experimental design than the fact that you're working in Kenya. In other words, you need to pay attention to the boundaries. You need to include that because a little cooperation between what otherwise never communicates can go a long way. But your experimental unit is very important. 
once you plug location in. Okay, next slide. So temporal, this is going to be more information than you want, but it turns out that if you're going to breed hybrid rice, one of the first things you have to do is you have to, unlike maize, where the male and female flower are separate, so if you want to force the pollination, you just cut the top off one of them, rice it's together. So they put genes in that are sterile at certain temperatures. So if you're going to create 